A lot of things to cover. As you know, the trust in the Lord teaching is now 13 years old. And Almighty God, his name is Jesus, said a year or so ago that this teaching is now the North Star of the elect. And primarily what I have been doing in the trust in the Lord teaching is actually teaching the elect because we've stepped into a class of people. And please don't think I'm being big headed about this, uh, Elder Hartfield. Don't think that I am, you know, boasting of myself, God forbid. But it, it, it's kind of like God Almighty has chosen our church and the elders and leaders, the Mary Magdalene group of our church, to teach uh, the, uh, the, the persona or the group called the elect the way the Apostle Paul was called to teach the Gentiles the way of the laws of Moses, though I think Paul veered away from the strength of those laws in many instances, especially the Sabbath. But here's, here's what I'm trying to, the, 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 uh, the, the, the picture that I want to paint today is that over the years, over the past few years now, in the past 12 years, but certainly over the past three years, the assignment of the outlaw church, all of its members, including its youngest member, whether it be Naomi or Jerusalem or Christmas, all of our efforts and our assignment, and please listen to this, has been to teach the new class of the elect. That is to say, most people know how to be religious and some even know how to be Christians. Now, to be a Christian and to be religious is not the same thing you must have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ to qualify as bona fide uh, in your walk with God and biblically correct. But we have moved from that era now to the era of the elect as we have moved into the presence of the tribulation. And so what has been my job, and, and this is a revelation that you can, you know, that you can put into category, uh, Esther Bennett, estimated what has been my job is now, and this is a revelation, is that I am now teaching the class called the elect. We've moved from the class of Jews to the class of Christians and now to the class of the elect. And that has been my job and that's where the focus has come from and that's where all these revelations as uh, Evangelist Carter has said are coming from. It's coming from the fact that we are teaching a whole new class of representatives of God's word called the elect. The Jews were a representative of God's word and praise God and what a mighty representative and they still are and I give God the praise for the Jews, I do, and for every word that Moses spoke. And then Jesus came along and established the church and Peter and James and John and Paul were charged with the responsibility of teaching the class called the church, mainly to the Gentiles. And that went on and has been going on now for the past 2,000 years. And now Almighty God has brought us to the point of the tribulation and he has chosen the Atla church and its leadership, its elders and its members. That's why I stated the other day that the devil has attacked the elders and the leadership of the church so that they would not have the power to function. Now, they, they, God has, has healed them and set them free. But God has chosen the outlaw world missionary church's elders and leaders to teach the new class, the third and final class of God's program called the elect. So we have the Jew, the Christian, and the elect. Now, we are the elect. Uh, and and what I, so we're going to be focusing on that revelation as God has given that to us, as, and that's what we've been, and that explains everything we've done going back over the past few years. It actually explains everything we've done going back to about, to about 2007. It explains everything that we have done. If you realize now that the assignment of the Atla Church and its members is to teach the class called the elect. And therefore, God has called Harlem the New Jerusalem. And we've heard about the two wombs and the revelations and the word Atla, because first it was the Jews. Moses' job was to teach the law of the Jews. Then came Jesus, who, who shed his blood. And then Peter, James, and Paul, Peter, James, and John, and, and, and Paul, and others 
taught the class called the church. Now it's our responsibility to teach the group a class called the elect. So Bennett, you'll make note of that revelation as, those re as these revelations are now coming forward so we can better understand what mode we're in. We have moved beyond the church to the group called the elect. Now that does not disqualify the church as the church did not disqualify the Jews. You understand, I'm not saying that the church is disqualified. I didn't say that, as I would never say that the Jews and the teachers of laws of Moses were disqualified. I would never say that. I teach all of that. But it was not the job of the Jews to teach the elect. It was not the job of the church to teach the elect. It's the job of the elect. And that has been our glorious assignment. God has so favored the outlaw church and its membership, his leaders, and its elders. God has so favored the outlaw church to teach the ministry and the class of the elect. That we must uh, now come to terms with, which gives us why we are who we are and why we are defined as who we are. So please be mindful of that uh, going forward, and it'll clearly understand why God is doing in us the, the type of things that he's doing. So we want to call this the, 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 the class of the elect. Thank you very much, Mr. Engineer. Now, we are in the tribulation, as you can very, very well see uh, that that's happening, that we're in the tribulation. We'll talk more about that and what that will be, but uh, the, the, the term elect comes from the Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 22, except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. In other words, all people will be killed on planet Earth because of the tribulation, whether it be the coronavirus, or whether it be earthquakes, or, or whether it be wars, or, or whether it be famines, that all the people on the Earth will be killed except the elect. And so that you need to be mindful of. And we also want to point up several things that Almighty God's given to us that we might be able to uh, to explain. Now, I want to, now that we understand what we're doing, and God has now dropped the revelation as to what we're doing and who we are, well, who is the Outlaw World Missionary Church? Well, they are the church of the elect. They are the, they are the last, the third, they are the trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, trinity of the purpose of God on earth, first the Jew, then the church, and then the elect. And that's what has been our assignment. That's why we are uniquely who we are. And we are, if you go back and look at the Genesis, that is the beginning of the Jews and their struggles to try to bring forth and manifest God's word. And look at the church and the persecution of the church and its attempt to, and Paul's attempt to try to manifest and bring forth uh, the teachings to the, of, the, of the church. And look at the elect and you'll see we're right in sync with the two preceding moves of God, the church and the Jew and the church. Now, having said that, I want to, I'm going to come back to that. We're going to hear a lot more about that teaching about the class of the elect that we're now in and teaching. But, you know, I want to express what I've been doing over the last few days is to help people to understand who they are as the elect, because the many of you have been chosen to be the elect and a number of you have been listening to me for years as we first got started, as the elect class teaching got started, but you've not made a commitment, and I want to go over that with you. Um, you Brother James Hanukkah down in Louisiana, his mother, who was the wife of a Methodist preacher, told him years ago, and I think if I'm correct, she was pretty much on her deathbed in a hospital in Florida. And she told him he would see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The way Moses and Elijah saw the presence of Jesus Christ on earth, even though they lived 2,000 years pre previously, Jesus prophesied that there'd be some standing here that will see his second coming. Moses and Elijah, who lived prior to the coming of Jesus, saw his coming, saw his first coming. But Jesus said there'll be some that will see his second coming, and some standing here. That, and, and so, but Brother Hanukkah's mother saw him and said that he will see. Now, I can't call you, and thank God she did. Praise God she did that. But I can't call you into the elect, but I have been called to teach those of you who have been chosen to be the elect. And my, the, the specifics of my lesson today will be to help you to understand uh, what are the obstacles and why, though you've been listening 
And though you have been growing and being spiritually, divinely, anointedly educated, you've not made a commitment yet. The Lord showed me a horrible scene. And in that horrible scene, the, 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 the synopsis of it was that I had to make a choice. I had to make a choice between staying with my family, that's my blood mother, blood brothers and sisters, and not just them, but in that grouping was the Baptists and the Baptocostal, because at one time I was kind of like in the Baptist and the Pentecostal movement. And I had to make a choice. I was also in, you know, the African-American movement, you know, the, that, that civil rights movement, the Dr. King type of movement. And I was in it. And the Lord was calling me out of it. I have been chosen by God and in order for me to fulfill my mission. Like the Lord showed me this in a vision. In order for me to fulfill my mission, I had to step outside of my blood family, my blood mother, brothers and uncles and father. I had to step outside of the doctrine of the Baptocostal church, the civil rights, uh, all that that went on. And not that all of that was bad, mind you. Not that all of it was bad. That's not what I'm saying. But it just wasn't God's calling for me, and it wasn't God's ultimate plan. It was not what God put in order. Uh, and so... I, God was calling me out of that because that was not God's plan. And I had to step out as if I was stepping out of a spaceship or stepping outside of a balloon or stepping outside of a bubble. I had to step outside, open the door with all the people in there, all the Baptist preachers, all the Pentecostal preachers, all my family members, all my friends, all the church goers, all the civil rights marchers, all of that group. They were all in that bubble. And they were all there, the preachers, the black, the white, everybody, they were all inside of that bubble. And I was in the mix of all that, literally millions of people were within that. And God was on the outside of it, calling me to step out of it. I had to step out of it. And there were some heroes in there, allegedly heroes and big time people, you know, leaders and everybody who had big names and all that kind of thing. And God was calling me out of it. And I was hesitant. Because where God was calling me, it looked very barren. Didn't look like a whole lot was going on. It was just, it looked kind of gloomy, quite frankly. And nobody out there but Jesus calling me to leave all these people, leave all this wealth and all these things that I could do, all the money and all the mansions and all that, and all that family and friends and partying and, you know, and family reunions and all of that church going and all those anniversaries and conferences and convocations and all of that. I, God was calling me outside to something. It was just him out there. I looked out the bubble and it was just Jesus. And he's telling me to step out and come to him. And I was a bit hesitant about, about stepping out from my family Stepping out from my friends, stepping out from all the preachers, the churches, the associations, all the meetings and revivals and anniversaries and all that thing. The Lord it was caught. And won't nobody out there but him. I look outside that bubble and there ain't nobody out there but Jesus. He tell me to come out, leave all of these people and come out there to him, to come under him. And I was hesitant about doing it. And to some degree, I, I mean, I didn't, I didn't say I wasn't going to do it. But when the Lord realized that my spirit was, was not in, in agreement with stepping out, even though I, know, I, knew, I knew it was Jesus, I knew that was Jesus calling me. I knew that was Jesus. And then the Lord said to me that uh, these people are not following him. And what do you mean these churches aren't following you? He said, these people, these preachers, these people, even my mother and everybody, he said, they're not following me. And if you follow them, 
the people that you're leading will not follow me either. And in that, I had to realize that I had to come to Jesus because he's telling me that they're not following him. And obviously, it was pretty obvious and clear, if they were following him, then we would not have all been in that Baptist Pentecostal church bubble, family reunion, anniversary civil rights, African-American bubble. We would not have all been in that bubble if they were following him. And that he was calling me out of it. He didn't call them, he called me. And I have to tell you, for me to come outside that bubble, I knew I was gonna give up a lot. You know, I hold a pretty classic Ivy League degree. I, I hold a, a, you know, the Ivy League school degree. That, you know, that's, the, that's the top of American universities. You know, my school is listed among the Ivy League, and my school that I graduated from, and my master's degree program, is listed as the absolute best theological seminary on planet Earth, including Oxford and Cambridge that people want to go to my school rather than going to Oxford, at least for theological training. So I had pretty much, I had my life all written out for me uh, to be in the classiest places, to walk among the wealthiest people, politicians and, and developers of the world. I had the opportunity to do it and get them long, that long, long money, you know? I, 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 and for me to, for me to, to leave that, and go out there with Jesus, with nobody out there but Jesus. For me to leave that and go out there with Jesus, I was gonna have to leave all of that. I was gonna have to leave all, I could have had a big name, big money, big house, all that. But then the Lord showed me, and this is the thing that really shocked me. The Lord said to me, who are you willing to please? your family and your friends, or me. Now, one of them you're going to disappoint. Either you're going to disappoint your, me and leave me disappointed and please your family and your friends and yourself, or you're going to disappoint your family, your friends, your Baptist Pentecostal, your union seminary student uh, fellowship, you're going to disappoint them, and you're going to please me. At that point, it was no longer a decision. At that point, there was nothing to talk about. I'm definitely not going to disappoint Jesus. Not if I can help it and know it. So if the choice became, and it did, the choice became between my family, my friends, and, uh, uh, and, and Jesus, I chose Jesus. And then I went on about changing the church from Sunday worship to Sabbath worship. One of those Easter Sunday morning, we were having a worship service, and I was singing, I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. That song said, I left my uh, family in Kindred, to have friends in, I left my friends in Kindred, bound for the promised land. The grace of God upon me, the Bible in my hand, in distant lands I trod. Crying sinner, come to God, and I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. And when, I, when Jesus put that to me, well, who's it going to be? Are you going to please your family and your friends, including your mother? You know, I'd put my mother in her place. I'd tell her, you know, because she thought because she's older than me and that she'd been in the Baptist church all her life. You know, she had no idea about Jesus and what he was doing and dealing with me. And he had, she had no idea about you know, it was just a religious group. It wasn't a relationship group with Jesus. They didn't have a relationship with Jesus. They were religious. It was a religion. And then, you know, the Baptist was different from the Methodist. There are all these different churches in town. But none of them have a relationship with Jesus. They just, have, they just were religious. And I had to leave them. It wasn't easy. Until Jesus said to me, who are you going to, who are you going to follow, me or them? And, and who are you going to, and when I left, they were all disappointed right to this very day. Right here in Harlem, New York City, I used to be the secretary of the Baptist Ministers Conference, the so-called greatest conference in the world. I was secretary of the United Missionary Baptist Association, secretary of the Empire State Baptist Association. And the reason why I was secretary and not president is because I was a young boy. I had just joined. 
as I would move up the ladder, I'd become the president. I could have become the president of the national associations if I'd stayed in that group. You know, they were grooming me. I was a young boy. I was a seminarian. I just got out of seminary, had a master's, a classic Ivy League degree. Everybody thought the world of me. Everybody thought the world of me. Here I am with that master's degree. Yeah, go ahead and put it up there, Mr. Engineer. I have a Baptist Minister's Conference. And there's my name, the Reverend Dr. James Lawrence Manning. I was under that name. I was a secretary back in 1986 and 87 as well, 88 too. And 85 as well. I, you know, and I was, that was just one of the groups. I was secretary of all these groups, all the Baptist groups. I was, and I was headed to be the president. But I walked out, I, I, I walked out one day. And I walked out because the Lord said to me, well, who's it going to be? Now, if I stayed with them, they'd be very happy with me. I'd be very pleased. But I would have, I would not have, and I would not have been serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is this important? It's important because you're going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to make the same decision I made. You're going to have to make the same decision I made. Who is it going to be? And by the way, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world? What would it have profited a man? What would it have profited me? To gain all that acclamation, all that wealth, all that recognition, all that so-called power, political power, religious power, all that money, what would it have profited me to stay there and gain all that, but yet I would have lost my soul? Elizabeth and I, we watched the movie. Thank you, Mr. Engineer. There it is right there. Jesus wrote. That, right, right, right. So what, 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 I had gotten all that money, but I would have lost my soul. Leave that after just a second, Mr. Engineer. Elizabeth and I watched the movie the other night called The Inside Man with Denzel Washington. You ever see it before? And another guy named Christopher Plummer. And, uh, and there's another woman, I forget her name now. Jody somebody, Judy Jody somebody. Uh, anyway, this guy, Christopher Plummer, uh, he owned a group of banks in New York City, the movie portray. And uh, he had, uh, his bank was being robbed. And the man that was robbing his bank knew that Christopher Plummer, whoever he had prayed, the name of the person he played, he knew that Christopher Plummer back, he was in Germany when the, when the Nazis were robbing the Jews of their jewelry, of their paintings, of their banks, of their money, of their land, of their property. And Christopher Plummer at that time sold out the Jews to the Nazis and the Nazis paid him big money and he was able also to get some of the the, the jewelry, the diamonds, and all that wealth as a young man, helping the Nazis. He was a Jew himself. He was a Jew himself helping the Nazis. He was a Jew, but he sold out his brethren to get rich. And then he started all these banks in America, and he was a very wealthy, very powerful man. But, you know, and the robber that was robbing his bank knew that he had that all that information. And Christopher Plummer said in a very painful moment, he said, you know, I, as a young man, I made a mistake. He said, I sold out my people for what I thought was a quick path to wealth and riches. And he said, I've been trying to buy my soul back ever since. Though I'm wealthy, I don't have any peace. I've been trying to buy it back ever since. Now I want to tell you something. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world? If I stayed in that group with my family, my mother and sister and all them people and all them pastors and all that, all my big name I had, I would have had plenty of wealth, but I would have lost my soul. And I still, I be to this very day, a wealthy man with a private jet, a Bentley automobile, you know, a 12 room mansion, but I'd be trying to get my soul back. I'd rather have my soul than have all that wealth. You see what I'm talking about? That was a very poignant part of that movie, Inside Man. Watch it if you ain't never seen it. Ain't a lot of, not, not, not a lot of vulgarity in it. What Christopher Plummer says very painfully, I lost my soul years ago and I've been trying to buy it back. You can't buy it back. Once you lose it, you can't buy it back. So now here's what I want to talk to you about. I made the decisions to step outside the bubble. I stepped outside of the Baptist I stepped outside the civil rights. I stepped out, outside my own family. Remember, I'm my own mama and daddy and everybody. I stepped outside. And I decided to serve Jesus. I left my fa for friends and kindred. I stepped outside. I decided I followed Jesus. And that's why I'm now the teacher of the elect. 
I'm now the, the messenger of God with the message of the elect in my mouth. And that's why the Lord is doing in the outlaw church what he's doing. When you look around the outlaw church, it's a very powerful organization. It's an extraordinary powerful organization. It is the Trinity and the final move of God. And it's, it is three stage movement of God, first the Jew, then the Gentile church, and then the elect. And we have been chosen and what I'm talking to you about is that you're going to have to make a commitment. You're going to have to step outside that bubble. You got to step outside that bubble and you're going to step away from your family and your friend. You got to do it. You're going to have to do it. You're going, you can stay with them, but you're going to lose your soul. And time is winding up. You've been hearing me talk to you and you know I'm talking to you and you know you got to step outside and don't go back to that Sunday church. You know you got to step outside that Sunday church and start keeping the Sabbath. And by the way, you know, a number of, of and, you have, and, and, and a large, because, you know, the message that we preach is a message to all nations, all kindreds, and all tongues. We've always uh, been uh, inspiration to all races of people, whether you're Jew or Gentile or Japheth. And you're going to have to step outside of your racist friends who say nothing good can come out of Harlem. You have to step outside of them. And nothing good. I had a lot of people I was dealing with until Tribulation Trump came along with his racism and his white supremacy. And they all, the J5 people, they all went by way of the cut flower. You're going to have to step outside of that. If you're j you got to step outside and say, wait a minute, this is a man of God. I'm not looking at his color. And then what makes it even, I suppose, uh, more difficult is that I'm up here in Harlem. If I was down in Tulsa somewhere, down in Dallas, you'd be talking about, whoa, yeah, right, uh, the, the Bible Belt. But now I'm up here in Harlem, the last place on planet Earth. But it's the first place that God chose. God has made Harlem the New Jerusalem. God has made Harlem the New Jerusalem. Well, so what's, what's it going to be? And then the other thing is that you don't want to tithe. You have to understand. You, you, you have to understand that the tither is more blessed than the people on Wall Street and the investment process called Wall Street and the purpose, the purchasing of stocks and watching stocks grow, going and growing and getting uh, lots of money and, in, and increase uh, through the process of buying stocks. All right. The problem with stocks with the market, there are two things that the market does. You can always depend on it. The market always does two things. It goes up and it goes down. When it go up, you grab a little money. When it goes down, you lose everything you have. But the tithe, people who are tithers, people who are tithers are better than stock market investors. When you tithe, you don't need to invest in the stock market. The tither, you listen to me now, you listen to me. You listen to me, because I could have had all the money in the world if I'd stayed in the Baptist I could have had the private jet, I could have had all the money in the world, all the power, all the big, I probably did by now though. But you listen to me, and you listen to Jesus. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Christopher Plummer, the inside man, check it out. Check it out. I could have had the whole world, but I'm a tither. And the tithe never goes down. It always goes up. The tithe never fails, because it's God's word. You need to understand that, I mean, it's like, it, it's like, you know, making you catfish hunter, trying to make you the world's greatest pitcher or catcher, and you don't have any arms. It, you say, I want to be a member of the elect, but I don't want to keep the Sabbath and I don't want to, I want to stay and hang out with my friends where you, you need to check yourself and I don't want to tithe. I don't want to give it. I mean, to tell me, I listen, listen, Pastor Manning, I make $1,500 a week and some weeks overtime with a little OT, I make $1,800 a week. That means I got to give $150 to $180 every week to the church. Yeah. But you have to understand, God says it's for meat in this house. And if you do it, he, he didn't say he'll bless the church. He said he'll open up the windows of heaven and, and pull you out of blessing so much so that you won't have room enough to receive. 
your stock market will always go up with the tide. The devil done lied to you. The devil done lied to you and told you to give $2. The devil done lied to you. The devil done lied to you and told you to use shenanigans to get your income. So, you, you know, it'd be, you say trying to be a member of the elect without, you can't be a member of the elect without keeping the Sabbath. And you can't say, well, I'll keep both. I'll, you can't serve two masters. You cannot keep the Sabbath with me. And then the next day on Sunday, run over there to a Southern Baptist or Methodist or Pentecostal or to the Catholic Church and keep Sunday with them. You're a hypocrite. You can't serve two masters. You can't serve two masters. You'll either love one and hate the other. And by the way, you're going to have to get out the bubble. You're going to have to get out that bubble. And that's up to you. Now, days are winding up. You don't know what's going to be tomorrow, whether it's coronavirus or whether some war. You, 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 you don't have it. The Lord is talking to you right now. You're going to have to make a commitment. You're going to have to make a commitment. You say, well, Pastor Man, I thought you said that the Lord came to you and, you know, and you were hesitant about, yeah, I was, but I, I, didn't, I, I didn't take all year. When God showed me that who am I going to please? My family member and my friends, the Baptist church, the civil rights, the African Americans, or am I going to please him? It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily nothing else to think about. Wasn't that, that, that. I had to think about the fact that, yeah, I know that if I step outside now, ain't nobody out there but Jesus, there ain't going to be a whole lot of money out there for me. It's going to be hard times, and all the other people are going to be having parties, and they're going to be giving them marriages, and they're going to be having anniversaries and going to the national conventions, and they're going to be doing all that kind of stuff and having all the politicians and all the civil rights marches and having all that, you know, and all the family reunions. They're going to be doing all that and stuff. And then being at the Emmy Awards and the, uh, the Oscars and all that kind of stuff, they're going to be doing all that. And then here I am on the outside. I had to make up my mind. I had to make up my mind. And it didn't take me two seconds, but two seconds to do it. I left all of that. And now the Lord is talking to you. You're going to have to make a commitment. This is, and uh, we spoke to Elder Esther Bennett, that this is the class of the elect. Now here you are, like the Jew, like the Jew, you were chosen to hear the words of Moses coming down off of Mount Sinai. You were like the Jew, you were, you were called to see the opening of the Red Sea. And then like the church, Peter, James, and John, you were able to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And see, even though Moses preached and prophesied that God was going to send a prophet uh, like him with, with Jesus and Elijah, then they got a chance 2,000 years later to actually see Jesus on Mount Transfiguration in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. And now Jesus is telling us 2,000 years after his resurrection from Mount Olivet that we're going to see him when he comes back the second time. But it's only for the elect. And so this is the third and the final phase of God's three-phase trinity movement on planet Earth called the elect. And God is moving through now. And he's sending that word out there. That's why you've been listening all these years. Brother Joseph Manning told me that uh, Brother Joseph Manning told me that uh, he uh, had been listening to me for, for years out there in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and down there in Hampton Roads, Virginia, somewhere down there in Hampton, Virginia, that he had been listening to me for years. And, uh, and finally, he, sat out, he made a commitment, and he'd been strong. He'd been stomped down strong ever since then. But you don't have years, my brother. Now, you don't have years to listen the Lord is calling you today to make that commitment. You have to drop that Sunday church, become a Sabbath keeper. You say, well, Pastor Man, I live up in, uh, out in Oregon. I live down in San Diego, California. Or I live over in South Africa or someplace. I know it. But we worship every Saturday. 
And every Saturday, though you're not able to physically be here, wash your face, brush your teeth, comb your hair, and put on some nice clothes. They don't have to be a suit and tie, but put on some nice and decent clothes and sit there before your computer. And if you got the facility to put that on the television, then put me on the television at 10 o'clock. Make everybody in the house come and sit there uh, in the living room, just like you in church. Now, you listen to very carefully. Listen to these instructions very carefully. Wash your face, comb your hair, brush your teeth, clean yourself, take a bath, and get ready for church every Saturday at 10 o'clock. Now, if you're over in Brisbane, Australia, uh, if you're over there like Sister Susan Christian, or Sister Millie over there in London, uh, a brother Canaan over there in London, then, you know, you get to 10 o'clock, it'll be 7 o'clock or whatever it is, uh, 5 o'clock. But come to worship. Listen to the message. When I say stand up, you stand up. When I say it's time for the tithe and the offering, get out your checkbook. Just like you're sitting in the church, you're sitting in your home, or you may be even at your business. Like uh, Elder Paul McFarquhar, he and Sister Debbie McFarquhar, they ain't got no customers there. When I call for the offering, get out your checkbook, write out a check, write it out right there and then. Or get out your cash app, which is not so convenient. That cash app is a mind blower. It's so convenient. If you don't know, got a cash app, go to the app store and download the cash app. And uh, our cash app signal is the uh, dollar sign at Otla. Now you listen to me. And then on Sunday, don't you go to that Sunday church. Well, that's what my mama and my daddy and my friends and all that. Don't you go to that Sunday church. You stay. Your tithes and your offer, and then listen to my instructions. When I give the order to march around Jericho, you need to be in line. You and your family member need to be in line. All right? So I told the Lord that the Lord said to me, and the Lord said to me, the first that uh, I, who was I going to please, him or my mother and my Baptist and Pentecostal and all that family reunion nonsense? And I said, Lord, I'm, I stepped outside the bubble. I've been outside now. It's been over 20 some years, nearly 30 years. I've been outside. And we stopped worshiping on Sunday and I changed the worship. We now the Sabbath worship and doing it for, over, for years and years and years. Mother One Whitaker will tell you. She danced. Mother One Whitaker, she's a dancer. She used to be a ballroom dancer. Mother Whitaker. She used to be a ballroom dancer when she was a whole lot younger. She's pushing up towards 80 now. But when she was younger, she used to be a ballroom dancer, Mother Whitaker. But uh, she knows. And she danced. On the day we had our first Sabbath worship, she danced and danced and danced. She danced and danced and danced. Everybody knows that. So what's it going to be? Now, I think it's important that... Uh, you have been called. He that hath an ear, let him hear. He said, well, Pastor Man, I don't know if I'm one of the ones. You've been listening to me, and you hear what I'm saying. You have an ear to hear what I'm saying. Let me read some scripture for you. Let me read it out of Jesus. So let Jesus tell you. I'll let Jesus tell you. Because I, I can't call you. I, I can't do it, my brother. I can't call you, but Jesus can. Now here. In, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, uh, starting at verse 11. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, starting at verse 11. He answered and said unto them, Because it's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not given. For whosoever have, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, to him it shall be taken away. Even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because seeing they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, and neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For these people's heart is walks, grow, wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes, they have closed, lest at any time 
they shall see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their hearts and should be converted and I should heal them. So he, if you're listening to me, if you're listening to me, then God has healed you. Or the Lord has called you. If you because there are people that they listen to me, Pastor Man is crazy. He racist. He hate the LGB. He hate gay people. He know we're supposed to love everybody. He know that God is love. And all that nonsense, that crazy tobacco uh, chewing, snuff dipping, cigarette smoking, liquor drinking. It, 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 they're crazy, I tell you. He, 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 he a hate preacher. And, I, and he, he need to be nice to people. I don't like the way he talk. Uh, he, he, he need to be nice. Nice to who? Nice to sinners? Nice to murderers, rapists, father rapers, and mother stabbers? Why? Hey, you're full of sin as you can possibly be. You got more sin than hell itself. And you want somebody to pam pamper you and tell you how nice you look. You, the, the, you want the, the, yeah. Anyway, so it's up to you. Listen, I have got to go. I have to tell you that I'll be back uh, with more teaching. This is a bit of a news blog we do, looking at spiritual wickedness in high places for the most part, making uh, some observations about it and giving people a biblical foundation to the way of interpreting rather than have uh, uh, Sean Hannity or Laura Ingram or Janine Pirro or Anderson Cooper or Rachel Maydow or Don Lemon. Uh, Rush Limbaugh interpret what's going on in the world. You come to me and I'll tell you based on what the word of God says. They'll just give you their worldly sinful view. But the man in the world will tell you what God has said. Whether to say yea or nay. Whether to go or to stay. You'll be like led by the word of Almighty God. Come to the Manning Report on a daily basis to interpret the spiritual wickedness in high places because there's plenty of it that's going on. And so I am he, I'm the Lord, sir, James David Righteous Rebel Manning. And I'm here to serve you with news and information.